Welcome everybody. Hi, my name is Angie Vishianen and I am the founder of Leg Up Legal. We provide a pre-law mentoring program that connects prospective law students to lawyers for mentoring. And we started doing these Zoom meetups at the beginning of COVID-19 to allow pr prospective law students to have a chance to talk to each other and current law students and lawyers and folks who are boots on the ground in law school admissions so that you guys can get information to help you in your decision making for this cycle and next cycle and just teach you more about the legal profession. So I started inviting on many lawyers and folks to come chat with you. And today I have a very special guest with me. Um, we have Mike Spivey from Spivey Consulting and he is here today to tell you all the, to answer all your burning questions on law school admissions. So I'm super excited to introduce him. So Mike, I'll let you give a short um, bio about yourself and then we can get started with the Ask Me Anything. Sure, first, thanks for having me. Um, I don't know if it, how many of you all have interacted with Angie, but she sleeps less than I do, <laughs> right? So she's very responsive on LinkedIn, responding to everyone's comments as someone who, has run a firm for eight years now. That's nearly impossible. <laughs> so I, I thank you and, and thank you for your sort of um, uh, energy level towards your commitment to helping people. Um, and I'm here to help people who are applying to law school. Hopefully I can answer all the questions that are thrown my way. I was uh, in admission starting in 19, no, yeah, 1999. So this is year 21 for me in admissions. And I've seen some challenging times. I was an admissions officer. I was supposed to be on a flight to the World Trade Center Marriott. The next day there was an LSAC fair on 9-11. On I was supposed to be on a flight. That is the most akin version I can sort of give everyone about what we're going through right now. So times are uncertain and there's a lot of uncertainty. So hopefully I'm here with my 21 years experience doing this to answer some of those uncertain questions. The law, I was at Vanderbilt Law School. Washington University in St. Louis and Colorado Law School. And now I, I run uh, Spivey Consulting. Fantastic. Okay, well, I'd love to go ahead and open the floor up. If you guys have questions, feel free to type your questions in the chat box or just unmute yourself and ask them to Mike Live. And I'd like to go ahead and start taking questions now. So what have we got? Hi, I had a question um, about like once whenever you get an admissions, um, like an, a law school accepts you and offers you a scholarship, um, do they usually tell you the term that the scholarship will be? Because my, my main problem was like, I don't know if that scholarship is only going to be for a year or for two years or for three. Right. And if you're able to like tell them, hey, is it okay if it's for the three years? Like, can you kind of like talk to them on what you want? Yeah, so that's a very good question. The terminology you're, terminology you're using are, there are law schools that, whose scholarships renew every year, some which are adjusted for even for uh, tuition increases. That's very rare. Usually, though, for most law schools, if you get a $20,000 a year scholarship, you're really getting $6,000, $60,000. So that for most law schools, not all, you, the $20,000 uh, repeats for two years. Some are grade dependent. So that's something you would want to ask your school. Do I need to maintain a certain GPA or do I lose a scholarship if I don't? And then a small number are what, what people call predatory law schools. They lure you in with $45,000 scholarship, but you automatically uh, do not renew. You, you auto opt out your second and third year. That is what you're, I think you're addressing because the predatory nature of these is a $45,000 scholarship sounds like a lot. It sounds like, you know, more than your twenty thousand dollar by by more than a twofold increase, but it's actually less than the sixty thousand dollar scholarship you would be given. There's two hundred and three ABA approved law schools, so there's no way I can go through every single law school and tell you which are, you you know, set for three years, which are grade dependent, and which are predatory. It is, I think your name is Marisol. Marisol, it is more than fine for you to ask the school, what are the terms of the scholarship? The way I would cage it to them is I would say, I've been fortunate enough to see other offers and th those were very precise. And I just wanna make sure as an aspiring lawyer, I'm reading the exact terms of my current offer. They, they will give you an answer. If they don't, 
you know, you, you can reach out to my company and we'll get an answer for you. Right. That, Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, adding to that, if they were not to offer me any scholarship, is there any possibility I can get one once I'm already in, or is that not likely to happen? Well, I wouldn't wait. To, I wouldn't wait till you're in. I, right now, okay. you have leverage. Once they admit you, they want to yield you. It hurts them at the at the tiniest of margins, but it does hurt them if you don't go to their school. Once they admit you, and if you go to another school, it hurts their uh, selectivity rate, which is a part of a U.S. News and World Report uh, ranking metric. So right now, you have leverage. If you have no scholarship money, don't wait till you arrive at the law school and ask for scholarship money. Say, you know, I'm debt averse and we're in a recessive economy and I'm looking at other offers. Do you have any money, you know, available? It's kind of a funny question because literally if they have money, you, you will likely get some, but a lot of schools are overcommitted. If you want, if you have $2 million to give out in scholarship money, you actually give out $10 million because you get a lot back because not everyone's going to go to your law school. Point being this, I wouldn't worry so much about like people are worried that scholarship negotiation sounds aggressive. It's much more hinged on whether they have money or not. You could honestly say me need money, right? So you don't have to be eloquent or you don't have to wordsmith this. It's so basic. If you have money, you'll probably get some. And if they don't, you probably won't. That Thank helps you me. so much. Yes, that helps me. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have a ton of questions in the chat box. So, oh God. Um, okay, so we've got, let's see here. Um, if your goal is really to get into a big school, how do you answer the why law school question? What advice do you have for applying um, if you're below the 25th percentile on GPA, but above the 75% yeah. LSAT? So I saw that. That's from Christopher Hamilton, I believe, and Christopher is interested in big law. Ah. But but the question is hinged on law school saying why law so the way i would answer this christopher is when you're in admissions you're actually not nearly as hung up on the why law is it the question might intimate your default is if the person's applying to law school they want to practice law my point being this sincerity really matters and I think sincerity is, in admissions does come through. When you've done admissions for 20 years, you can, you can read in, in sincere uh, one-page, two-page essays right off the application. If I were you, I would be sincere. I would say, I am interested in, you turn it around, turn it back on them as a compliment. I am interested in, in Cornell Law because your placement in big law in New York City aligns precisely with my lifelong career goals. And that's why you're at the top of my list. They, it's a sort of a, um, it's a masquerading question. While they're asking why law, they would probably rather hear about why their law school. So I would tilt it more in that direction. We also have a ton of questions that people submitted before in, um, okay. during the registration process. So I think I might want to jump back and forth between the ones in the chat box and the ones that people asked beforehand. So, um, so this person says they scored seven points higher on the May LSAT flex. Um, they're freaking out about wait lists and um, they did submit deposits for a school, but they're thinking about reapplying next cycle. So do you have any advice? Well, my first piece of advice is every law school that you're waitlisted at is going to get your, I mean, you can also send it to them, but they're going to get your seven point high. If they, if they're running data um, reports with LSAC, they're going to know that you scored seven points higher and that's really good. They're, they will, they, they will find you if you don't find them, particularly <laughs> schools that are looking to increase their LSAT. So I'm not, I'm not so worried right now for you about next cycle because I'm optimistic about this cycle. And I also think next cycle is going to be very competitive. If I were you, I would stay in touch with all the schools you're waitlisted at. Let them know you scored seven points higher. I would, for whoever asked that question, I would predict that you will see some positive waitlist movement this summer. Awesome. Um, okay, so in the chat box, Sabrina asks, for GPA addendums, she's a non-traditional student, graduated almost a decade ago, and had a 3.8 GPA, but um, she was taking almost double full-time classes, and um, she was working at the same time. Is there a good reason to write an addendum about that, or is that all I, obvious from the transcript and resume? Yeah, I would, I, 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 that's a great question, because I see this mistake too often. If you have a 3.8, and you write an addendum saying, I apologize, or I want to explain my 3.8 is it, over a static written piece of paper. 
it's not going to come across the right way. They're going to know in other parts of your application that you're a non-traditional applicant. They're going to see your transcripts. So I would not, I would, I would be very hesitant to write a, a, a addenda to all schools saying my 3.8 3 could have been better. Awesome. Okay. Um, so and I think this one's pretty softball question. Um, with the understanding that admissions looks at every applicant holistically, what do you think are the top three things they look at? Yeah. So, and we actually put up a blog recently where we rank ordered, I think it was something like 50 components of the application they look at. And, and it's pretty much loosely rank ordered. Uh, the, L, the, LSA, the LSAT put on by LSAC and now the GRE count for 12% of the ranking and GPA is 10%. So most schools are gonna look at the LSAT first and then your GPA second. GRE is interesting because the way the GRE is computed is if you have an LSAT and a GRE, they only look at your LSAT score. If you have a GRE score, it's the percentage of that school getting a GRE is how much it's weighted by US News and World Report. Let me explain that. If the school gets 90% LSAT, sco LSAT scores and 10% GREs, then the, temper then the GRE is going to have a 10% weight to it relative to the, to the LSAT. That's a long-winded way of me losing track of even the question. But LSAT, GRE, probably first, particularly LSAT. GP your LSAC computed GR uh, GPA second. What that means is your school may give you a 4.2 or a 3.6, what matters is what LSAC does with it. So I get a bunch of panicked emails every year, or my firm does, saying, wow, my 3.8 went down to a 3.6. What is my real GPA? The GPA your, the, the law schools care about is your LSAC computed GPA. So make sure you know that through LSAC. The third thing that's most important is how, to, I would put it this way, how you strategically optimize and differentiate yourself beyond your numbers your interview, your personal statement, your why essays, your resume, all that stuff, the, how you operationalize, strategize about that is the third most important. I have a podcast on our YouTube channel, Spivey Consulting YouTube channel, how I would apply to law school. And I rank order those things in that way. LSAT, GPA, application. I uh, actually dropped a link to your blog post that you oh, were describing you. as well in the chat box so everybody can take a look. Impressive. At that. Wow. Um, so um, for Jess uh, Gogan, I think is how I say it, um, her question is, um, she's con so let's see, obviously everything is very uncertain right now with the pandemic. She's concerned about the implications of the grad school recession rush and deferrals. So any predictions on how that's going to impact super splitters? Yeah, so I think I missed a word in there. The, the, the question is they're concerned with the uncertainty about the impact in, in the economy. And the, there was a word rush. I think uh, the grad beginning. school recession rush. So, okay, so right. if there's a recession, everybody floods into law school. Right. And then deferrals. How will that impact this cycle yep. and next cycle? Got it. I heard rush and I thought of the band for a second. So, <laughs> Higher education, particularly as the question um, very mindfully and thoughtfully words, higher education tends to be counter cyclical or inelastic. What that means is during the first year of, of, of a recession, we are going to see more people applying to law school, particularly because more people are also asking for deferrals. And add in the third variable, there's, it's an election year. Election years almost always trigger more applicants. So you have three atmospheric conditions. The number, of the number of deferrals being asked, the fact that we're in a recession and people tend to flock to grad school, and the election. I think that there are going to be, there's going to be a 10 to 20% increase in applications this year. Anytime there's an increase in applications, the cycle tends to be more difficult. This coming year will probably be a, a, a more difficult admission cycle than we've seen in the last five or six years. Got it. Okay. Um, and. That answers one of the other questions I got. How much more competitive will the next cycle be? 10 to 20% more competitive is my best. <laughs> this one I think is going to be tough to answer. Um, what will the legal job market be like post-corona? And will it be worth investing the time and money to go to law school? 
Yeah. yeah. The crystal so, ball on that one. <laughs> well, I, the, 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 that is a tough one to answer, right? So, uh, you know, prediction is difficult, especially when it involves the future, as, they, as someone <laughs> said. Um, I was a dean of career services as well, and it was during the Great Recession. I will say this. I don't think that what the recession that we're currently in is going to impact legal hiring nearly as long as the great recession impacted legal hiring. The reason why I say that is law firms, big law particularly, that used to hire cl classes of 100 and 150 summers, during the great recession, they went down to hiring five, three, 10 people, 150 to, to five. After the recession ended, they put up a bunch of measures so that wouldn't have to happen again because optically alone it was bad for their firm, but not just optically for financial reasons, three, four, five years later, they were missing all of these, um, entirely missing out on, on mid-level associates which start making the firm money. So all the circuit breakers that they tricked during the great recession, they don't wanna trip again because they saw that three or four years after the recession ended, they were having huge amount of problems getting work done because they didn't have mid-level um, mid associates. Point being this, I think that if you're applying to law school now, if you're about to go to law school, my best guess is that, we're, that you would much rather be in your shoes than a current rising 2L where there is gonna, you are gonna see sort of a, a, a great diminishment of hires. I'm not overly concerned yet. None of, again, none of us know. But as of yet, the, my best guess is I'm, I would be much more concerned as a rising 2L than a rising 1L, because I think this is gonna be a one year thing. I'd like to chime in on that a little bit. Just sure, um, being a practitioner and um, hearing the stories of, so I actually run a LinkedIn group for, it's like a job hunting support group for law students. And I have over 300 unemployed law students in that group right now. And the stories that I'm hearing are wild. <laughs> so um, I think what we're seeing, at least at the immediate current phase, is that yes, law school or law firms have scaled back their hiring a lot. And they've um, not necessarily rescinded offers, but a lot of them have had postponed offers. And they have, you know, they're like you, they're still waiting to hear back, like what's really going on with my offer um, for post graduation positions. Now, the people who had summer internships, a lot of them either got pushed back, so they only get four weeks of a summer or six weeks of a summer as opposed to a full 12 weeks of a summer internship. Um, but what I think is really happening is many law firms started rethinking the first year associate hiring process again because of the Great Recession a long time ago. I think that that was um, already underway when COVID hit. And I think that law firms are rethinking the way that they hire junior and first year talent at many different levels. And COVID may have been an accelerator, but it wasn't going to do anything that wasn't already happening. So I think if you're going to law school now, the types of jobs that you're going to see on the other side may be very different. Law firms are starting to hire differently. They're starting to hire on a project basis or they're starting to hire on a contract basis. But these magical first year associate positions that, oh, we're going to spend $190,000 on you right when you come out of law school, those are getting fewer and fewer. So I think that if you're banking on big law and you're banking on a first year associate position, you're going to see way fewer of those. But there, there are still job opportunities out there. You just have to be willing to, you know, be scrappier, look at other niche practice areas that are emerging, not your bread and butter practice areas. And you might want to hedge. So, you know, during bad economic times, like, bankruptcy and restructuring is a really good practice area to be in corporate mergers and acquisitions, not so much. So, you know, there's going to be flip sides of the coin in almost every practice area that during good economic times, corporate M and a, you know, all those bread and butter practice areas might be up, but then bankruptcy and restructuring might be down in a bad economic time. It'll flip. So you might want to think about that just going forward for long-term strategy. It highly depends on your practice area, what sorts of jobs are out there. Anyway, um, so let's see, next, uh, next question. So how should I, um, for a non-traditional student who graduated 12 years ago, how should they approach the personal statement, 
and any general advice as to how to approach the admissions process as a non-traditional student? Yeah, so I think you have an, a great advantage here. You have 12 years of likely life and work experience that 70% of applicants don't have. And what stands out in the personal statement is not some bloviating, bumptious, overwrought essay where people use words like bloviating and bumptious and overwrought. <laughs> it's, right? It's something that tells a true, a sincere story. That story literally doesn't even have to bring you to law school. I think there's a misconception that everyone has to end their personal statement with a, like, you know, a climatic last paragraph that says, and that's why raising elephants in Afghanistan at a refugee camp, true story from a former client of mine, that's what brought me to law school. If the personal statement is about how you started an elephant refugee camp in Afghanistan, don't worry about why law school. Right, that personal statement is going to differentiate. My guess is, as a, someone with 12 years work experience, you can tell a story, maybe from work, maybe from life, that the typical law school applicant can't, and that is going to be an advantage to you. The key to law school admissions is positive differentiation. What can someone who is a splitter with a, a GPA below the 25th percentile, but an LSAT above the 75th percentile, do to increase their chances at a T14? Yeah, so I wouldn't over I wouldn't over explain the GPA. And what I mean by that is if your GPA happened for very understandable reasons, you were ill, someone in your immediate family was or you were going through a challenging time, for sure talk about that. Have a one-page GPA addendum for every school addressing that those challenges. But if you were like me and it just took you one or two years to get your act together as an undergraduate and then your grades spiked upward, what you don't want to do is send a GPA addendum that six out of every seven law school applicants submit, which is if you pay particular attention, my GPA tracks upward over, the, over my four years. That's almost insulting when you're in a law school admissions officer because you see data right in front of you. You can see that. So I wouldn't overcompensate for the GPA. If you're going to be in any direction, having a LSAT above the, the 75th um, percentile is a very good starting point to be at. This is not a sales pitch, but you're our classic client. Our classic client is someone who's below something and above, and above another because we don't take people who are below both medians and have a dream school that they're not going to get into, right? If you have a 150 and a 2.0 GPA and you call us and say, I want to go to Harvard Law School, there's nothing we can do. If you have a 180 and a 4.0 and you call us, we say, there's nothing we need to do. Just don't be a moron, <laughs> right? In, in your case, I would button up the heck out of your application because you don't want them saying, this person is sloppy, hence the GPA, and they're going to be a sloppy law school student. So I would have someone, a family member, a friend, over and over again, proofread your application. That thing needs to be super professional. A super professional application in an LSAT above the 75th, and I think you're in a good position. A more nuanced question, kind of on the same turn. Um, I have a really high LSAT score, mid-170s, and an equivalent of a 3.95 GPA, but it's not reportable because it's international. So this qualified me from scholarships from some lower t tier one and some t schools and tier two schools. I'm going to reapply and try to figure out what, um, how to get a better chance at scholarships. What is your advice? Yeah, um, so this applicant, if they're in the 170s, uh, I'm going to guess the schools you're not getting scholarships from. The the LSAT scores this year, 170 and above, were up. I think the last time I saw it, it was like 8% or 10%. So you got slugged by a particularly tough cycle where LSAT scores in your bandwidth, 170 and above, happen to be up this year. We don't know what's going to happen next year. I think I do know there's going to be, I all but know, there's going to be more applications. But we don't know if, if 170s will be up. There's nothing you can do about your GPA right? It's not reportable. So you can't, man, you can't like manufacture a GPA. Again, in your situation, I would really focus on a differentiating personal statement. I would tell schools I'm reapplying because I'm not because I'm uninterested in your school, but I didn't get the results I was hoping for. 
and I'm incredibly interested in, in your school. Again, flip it on them. Use your reapplication to tell them they've always been your top school. Schools love hearing that because yield factors in the selectivity, which factors in the U.S. News and World Report rankings. So in your application, I would target every school. I would tweak my personal statement so that it's school specifically targeted. Are publications and extremely good grades necessary for getting into good law schools for LLM programs? Um, I would, <laughs> I would, I don't know how to answer that question because I've never been. So my firm only hires people with admissions experience because there's a lot of people out there that give admissions advice that's horrible because they've never made an admissions decision. I've never made an LLM decision. So I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I do have someone at my firm who was a, a dean for LLM programs at Wash U for something like 20 years. So if you actually email our firm that question, info at spivyconsulting.com, I'll have Peter Kramer, who's in charge of our LLM program, answer it for you. All right, perfect. Um, somebody says they took the LSAT two years ago and they're applying this fall. Should they retake it? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that based on not knowing the LSAT score and not knowing this person's um, ability. So I will say this, schools only care about your high LSAT score, okay? And, you're, and what you're, you're gonna find out is you're gonna read 100 times over online people saying school's average, and you may even hear from a few schools that have a party line that says something like, we look at every LSAT score. The only score that goes to US News and World Report, I can't say this enough, this has been a 10-year battle of mine, and everyone, in, uh, everyone on the Zoom uh, call can help me fight this battle with me, right? You're like Green Berets, you're, you're force multipliers. The answer is the only score that goes to LSAC is the highest score, the US News and World Report's the highest score. So scoring lower is not gonna hurt you. If you think you can score higher, by all means retake. You get three takes in one year, five in two years, seven total. So if you think you can do better, it's not gonna hurt you to retake. Let me just, let me just claim, if you take the LSAT five, six, seven times, you probably need to expl explain why you're doing that because it seems a little bit obsessive. If taking the LSAT is going to hold you back from applying on time, then don't retake the LSAT. But if you can apply on time, October, November, December, January, February, yeah, go for a higher score. Um, with the virus going on and prospective law students unable to get work experience or shadow lawyers, what are some ways that prospective law students can set themselves apart for law school admissions during this time while unable to work or do extracurriculars? So do you want, Angie, do you want to answer the first half? I think the first half was about shadowing lawyers, which is what your company is. Yeah, um, so I, I can't answer that. Uh, well, one, shadowing lawyers is always a, is a strange thing because not all lawyers are open to it. It's not like medicine where everybody just allows people to just shadow. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that lawyers work on that are confidential, and they're concerned about letting people just come in on a random day and see what's going on for their clients. Um, so not every lawyer will be open to it in general. Um, but there's still a ton of things that you can be doing right now to connect with lawyers. You can be attending networking events, going to um, bar association events that are virtual. I mean, almost every bar association that I know of, which are collections of lawyers, by the way, um, have taken all of their events online. And I advise all of my students to attend these events and connect with lawyers and panelists afterwards. And start learning more about what they're getting into. You should be networking with lawyers right now. If you are a prospective law student and you've never spoken to a lawyer about what they actually do, you are gonna put yourself in a really tough boat getting into law school. So, um, so I think there's tons that you can be doing now to reach out to lawyers on LinkedIn, calling them on the phone. You know, most lawyers are still working. We didn't stop. So, um, so I think there's still a lot that you can do to be understanding more about the law. And if you write a personal statement that says, I spent my COVID-19 connecting with over 80 lawyers, and this is what I've learned, I bet you somebody's going to pay attention to that personal statement. Um, so, you know, I think you you can do more um, to be learning from lawyers. It's not just, oh, I just need to show up at their place of work, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I would say a, a letter of recommendation from a lawyer who you had 40 Zoom calls with is just as strong as a letter of recommendation from a lawyer who you spent the summer with. 
everyone understands. In fact, I talked to the firm wide hiring partner of, of a top 10 uh, big law firm who said he would rather see people over Zoom now than in person because so much of their work is going to be over Zoom. Mm -hmm. he, he wants to see how you interview this way, not how you interview in person because your client development might be over Zoom and going forward. The one, my one sort of just, my one sort of cautionary tale is please don't let, if you're trying to connect with lawyers for the sake of them helping you with the mission, the worst advice I hear all the time is from lawyers. Why? Because they've never made an admission decision, but they tend to speak with a lot of confidence. And lawyers oftentimes, like depending on when we went to school, admissions is way different now than then, okay? So I echo Mike's advice in that most of us have no business saying anything about how to write a personal statement. I mean, we wrote one at some point to go to law school, but times change, admissions process changes. If you're talking to lawyers about the nuts and bolts of admissions, I wouldn't do that. I would talk to somebody like Mike. If you are talking to us to learn more about what is it like to be a lawyer because you're about to sign up for a career where you're gonna be a lawyer for 40 years of your life, that's what you should be asking lawyers about. You're asking us about our lifestyle, you know, asking us about what types of things that we do in our day-to-day -day experience and whether you can actually see yourself doing that kind of work. I mean, the things that you think that lawyers do may not actually be anything close to what their actual job is. So depending on what practice area you're in, the type of work you do can be completely different. So please connect with a lot of lawyers, learn what we actually do in lots of different areas. And talking in an interview about what you learn from lawyers is great. Having a lawyer t tell you to write your personal statement on the three most no. impressive things in your resume, not great. Not great. Agreed. <laughs> totally agree. Um, and whenever students for the record ask me about like how to write things in their application, I'm like, you know, I can tell you my advice, but take it with a grain of salt because I haven't ever, you know, been in admissions, but like, these are some people you can talk to and look at like people like Mike. So, um, all right. Uh, questions. How does an applicant figure out their LSAC, um, GPA if they haven't actually like gone through the process of registering and submitting a CAS report? Yeah, there's a couple, just Google LSAC uh, GPA calculator. There's a couple of calculators out there. They're, they're, every once in a while, they're a, a little bit off. But if you, want, if you have a 3.89 and you want to know whether it's going to go down to a 3.6, those calculators would be able to tell you. It, they might say you have a 3.85 or a 3.92, and they might be like one hundredth of a decimal off, but they're pretty, they're pretty close. Um. I'm a law student in the UK and I'm, a pl I'm planning to study for a JD in the US. I was wondering what the admissions office would think about international applicants who are doing a second law degree in a different jurisdiction, um, considering the current situation and the possibility of the admission cycle being very competitive. Do you recommend that, what do you recommend that I do to make my application stand out as an international applicant? Well, if you already have a law degree from the UK and you've already practiced law, it's a wonderful opportunity to stand out. Just don't lecture. Keep in mind, I, most deans of admission are former lawyers. So they've practiced law too. So don't explain to them what the law is. There's a 95% chance they went to law school. There's an 85% chance they used to practice law. But I think it's a wonderful opportunity to say, I've, been to law, I've actually been to law school. It's in the UK, but now I want to practice in America. And I've always wanted to go to NYU Law, right? Again, talk about their school because at my institution, we didn't learn this type of law. We learned that type of law. And now I want to learn the kind of law you teach at NYU. So again, don't lecture them about the law. Talk to them about why you want their law degree. <laughs> what are the most important aspects of an application for a Vanderbilt application? <laughs> ah, I can't, I can't do it in specific schools. I particularly can't do a specific school where I used to work at. And I, I, I to my knowledge, I think maybe there's one or two people in the office that I helped hire. So uh, again, I would say positively differentiate. Don't think you have to write a formal buttoned up, boring application about all the things you've accomplished. Talk about something that's sincere and dear to you. With Vanderbilt, I would say in all schools, stay in touch with, visit in person if you can, visit over the phone if you can't. Vanderbilt tends to go pretty slowly. So don't get, um, the thing I would say about, the one thing I'll say specifically about Vanderbilt, if it, there's no telling 
if three months goes by, four months goes by, that that means that they're not interested in you. So don't let the slowness of their process cause you to overreact in startup, you know, emailing them every week. Have you received this? Have you received that? Vanderbilt's nature tends to be pretty slow and methodical. That means they're reading your application carefully. So that's good if you have a strong application. Um, especially given the current situation with the BLM. I don't know what the BLM is. Um, Black Lives Matter. Oh, got it. Um, and the importance of ending oppression in marginalized communities. I'm concerned about writing a diversity statement for an aspect of my identity that is seen as tr too trivial. Um, I'm autistic and I have ASD and I'm wondering if we're writing a diversity statement on these aspects of my identity are counter to the point of a diversity statement. No, I would say that uh, um, I, re I appreciate the candor in the question and I would say that I would absolutely, if any sort of aspect of your life matters to you, I mean, what is diversity? You can see something from someone else's perspective because your perspective has opened your eyes to the fact that your challenge might be different than other people have to overcome. Therefore, their challenges might be something that you, that you want to be more open-minded about. Point being, I think that would, that's a great diversity statement topic. I feel so bad that you say that that's a trivial aspect. The person who asked this, I don't think that's trivial at all. I think yeah, there's nothing yeah. there's nothing trivial trivial about that. That's a that, I, I, it's a great topic to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, making our profession more accessible for people with disabilities is absolutely a very important topic. I would absolutely write about this in a diversity statement. My two cents. Um, Somebody asked if they can ask questions with the mic or only chat. Yeah, feel free to chime in, please. I really don't like reading these questions, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to read them as long as people keep submitting them. Um, will law schools scale back their scholarships due to the increase in applicants for the 2021 cycle? Basically, is it if there's more demand, is there less pressure for the law schools to be generous? Yeah, I'm not so much worried about the demand as I'm worried about that since the Great Recession, law schools haven't really been making nearly as much money as they used to. And they've, because of that, they've had to get much more central university funding. Some law schools are, are entirely underwritten by central university. COVID is a much greater challenge to universities than it is the law schools because universities get a huge amount of the pie of their re revenue from tuition room board associated fees, athletics, student centers. I remember when I was a student, I always thought it was funny that, I thought it was funny when I, I was bragging to my parents, we have this beautiful brand new student center at Vanderbilt and I don't have to pay for it. And my parents were like, you idiot, it's part of your tuition. <laughs> your tuition would be less, less if they didn't have the student center. My point being this, all those central universities that charge money for so many things are going to be hemorrhaging money if they're online. And COVID is already impacting them for other reasons. I, one major university alone had to prorate $33 million in room and board by sending students home a month early. Law schools are not going to get as much money from their central universities as they've had for the last six, seven years. And I do think that we're going to see, not this cycle, but next cycle, a tightening of the belt as far as scholarship money. What is the most pervasive bit of bad advice that you've heard in applying to law school? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the biggest one by far and away, the one that's malpractice like is only take the else at once. When I see people giving that advice, and I've seen actually people who pose as admission, admissions consultants give that advice, you're potentially costing the applicant $150,000 in scholarship money if they score three points higher or a school that is much more their dream school because your high score matters. The second worst piece of advice I got was this like scammer who wanted to like charge thousands of dollars to proofread personal statements. And he said in the vet, in a video, 80% of what matters to law schools is your personal statement. No, 75% of what matters to law schools are your GPA and your LSAT or 80%. Yeah. So if you're going to dedicate time to anything, dedicate time to getting a strong LSAT score. If you're an undergrad student, dedicate time to your LSAT score and your GPA. On once that you, note, oh, yeah. sorry. I was going to say, once you accomplish that, then of course, submit the best application you can. 
On that note, what are the best strategies to increase your LSAT score? And what are suggest your suggestions for affordable LSAT tutors? <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't recommend any particular LSAT tutor because then 59 other ones are going to send me eight mean emails. <laughs> um, I will say this, everyone has a different learning style. So it's a tough question for me to address without knowing someone's learning style. The LSAT should not intimidate anyone because we have seen, I have seen the COO of my company went from a 150 on her first test to a 174 on the real test, right? It's a highly learnable test. It's not a test of intelligence. It's a test of aptitude. Mm -hmm. So definitely get some sort of help, whether it's books, online courses, or some of the companies you said. The other thing I, I would say is the biggest mistake I, ma I see made is people do not set their conditions when they're studying is state dependent learning says that the more you can imitate game day, test day, and Angie could probably talk to this, the better you're going to retain things. So don't take a practice LSAT, pause it, answer texts, watch Magnum PI. <laughs> probably not, that's probably not popular for you all. It was when I was your age. Don't watch TV, make the conditions for yourself miserable when you're taking practice LSATs. Yeah, and if you're taking the LSAT flex, like take it under the conditions you would take the LSAT flex, which is, you know, try to make sure that there's no distractions around you, but realize like you're at home in your normal space. You're not at a testing center. So like you need to figure out how that's going to work for you. Um, LSAT flex is just a different ball game than your normal LSAT. So. And the final um, thing I would say is I often tell my clients to give themselves two to three less minutes per section on some of their practice tests than on the real test. It's called narrowing the goalposts. In football, they do that. Field goal kickers kick through these, in practice, these really unnecessarily thin goalposts. So during the game, the goalposts look really wide. Mm -hmm. If you give yourself on some practice tests five less minutes, it's going to seem like you have extra time on the real test. Yep. Um, how would you explain an, if your GPA has a downward trend throughout undergrad? Yeah, it would probably, to me, the answer would depend on what your GPA is. If you, if you go from a 4.0 to a 3.6, 3.5, I literally would not address the issue. Don't bring it to their attention. They're going to care a lot more about the 3.5 than the reason for the 3.5. What do you, oh, so that said, if there was something like a sickness or an illness or an adversity, then yeah, definitely bring it up. How do you recommend finding the right balance between having a, professional application and resume and being personable? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say you can be both personal and professional. To me, professional means you, I mean, look, Angie's a lawyer. When I was in admissions, the, what mattered to me was not so much whether the, the person used wordsmith words to impress me, but whether the words they said were incredibly precise. So if you use precision of words, but you talk about how uh, Dungeons and Dragons was an awesome game, not just because you, you, you became, uh, you went from an introvert to an extrovert. You know, I read, a, I read a personal statement once about Dungeons and Dragons and how this person was very shy, but then they play with a group of people. That was a great personal statement. And it was also professional because their word choice was very precise. In two pages, they didn't have sloppiness, they didn't have uh, mistakes, and they used very precise words. If you want an example, Google my name Spivey and failure is a liar. Because I write about something that happened to me in, in first grade. It, this was a motivational essay, it has nothing to do with law schools. But I shared it with deans of admission, and they're like, if I, only I got a law school application that talked about this, I would be so excited. So I, if you want an example of something that I, I hope, I mean, it's my own writing, so I don't want to be like too biased. I hope this is an example of something that's both professional and, you know, not static. It's, it's personable. Yeah, I think professional, it's not about filling it with legal jargon or big flowery words. That's not what we look for when we're looking at legal writing. We look for people who are concise. 
We look for people who make sure that the writing is error free. Don't fill it full of typos. <laughs> um, good organization. Does it have a flow? Does it make sense? Are you making me skip all around the universe? <laughs> like, I mean, that, those are the things that we care about, you know, organization, brevity. Uh, that's what makes a good legal writer, not how many legal words can I throw into a personal <laughs> statement. <laughs> So, um, there's but yeah, two, there's two examples. You can also Google, and I hate that I keep giving you my name, but you can, you can Google Mike Spivey's favorite personal statement and that, that one is incredibly professional, but it's not about a professional topic at all. What do you have? What advice do you have for someone on the wait list who has already sent a letter of continued interest? Uh, I would ping that school once a month with an email. You're still my top choice. I would go there in a heartbeat. And then there's no reason the end of July, why you don't, why you, there's no reason not to call them. Because at the very end of the cycle, a school's medians are pretty much locked in. If they're shooting for a 167 and they have it, and they have it by 15 slots, you might just call them on the right day. This happens every year. This is like the greatest thing in the world. You pick up the phone and you call a law school office and they just lost three people who that they thought were matriculating. Three people that day told them their medians are locked in. So they literally read your file. They see that your application is great. They call you back 10 minutes later and you can admit. Can I promise that's going to happen? Of course not. Is there any reason not to do it? No, just try it. Uh, hey, Mike, it's so great to see you. I'm such a huge fan on the subreddit. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, so Thanks. basically, I'm, um, as I said, I'm an international applicant. I'm in at a school that's in like the 50 to 70 ranking uh, and not with a full scholarship, although my LSAT is like above their median by like 10 points or something. And I'm also waitlisted at like HLS and other T14 schools. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very strongly considering reapplying if I don't get off any waitlist. Uh, and so in reapplying, I'm wondering whether... Um, ad admissions uh, admissions teams can see my old letters of recommendation and and if if they can whether I should submit new ones if I have other strong ones or whether they can't see them That's a, and yeah. also whether you have any advice on reapplying if you think I left some points on the table Thank yeah you. so I would absolutely absolutely they can see your old letters of rec they can see every email you've ever sent to them it all goes into your file how many times you visited their campus there's boxes for that in your file but they they won't care the, for the letters of recommendation i don't know of a single law school that's going to say we need new letters of recommendation so you're totally fine with letters of recommendation if 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 one extra person wants to give you one submit it but you don't need one uh, on your point in particular I, you know if you're if you're above the median lsats of some of these schools you're waitlisted at I wouldn't, yeah, maybe you, you'll have to apply next cycle, but I would ideally, if I were you, I would stay in touch with the schools that waitlisted you. I would, you know, email them that they're still your, uh, the top of your radar. And then if they admit you, you don't have to go, but you can then email the schools where you only have 50% scholarship and you're 10 points above your, their LSAT score. And you could say, I thought I was going to, you know, Brown Law School, but Princeton Law School just admitted me and now I'm torn. Because Princeton Law School in a recessive economy is showing me all their career opportunities. And I'm very debt averse. Do you have any more money? Obviously, I just made up Brown and Princeton. Neither have a law school because I don't want to name particular schools. I'm a law student from India planning on applying for an LLM at a top-notch university. Wanted to ask what international students should do um, to stand out. Yeah, I mean, again, if, if, law school if law school admissions is about differentiation, and it is, then probably culturally, your experience is different than 80% of applicants or 85% of applicants or 90% of applicants, depending on the school, 99% of applicants. I had a client who was from um, Korea who spent her first weekend in America at a Halloween party had no, no idea what Halloween was, right? So she literally wrote about the cultural transition of stepping off a plane in America and having to be rushed with her foster family, the sponsor family, to a costume store and dressed you know, in a costume and then going to a party where she had no idea what was going on. So that, what, that 
personal statement wasn't about being in a, in a Halloween costume. It was about the cultural difference and the cultural shock that she experienced. That helped her stand out. Um, I have a phone call in two minutes. I can be a couple minutes late, late to it, but we probably maybe one or two more questions. Oh gosh, there's so many. Um, let's see. Uh, some of these I just can't really. What's your best advice for reapplicants? Uh, I think so many people who reapply think that it's going to hurt them to apply to a school that denied them. And the, and the answer is no, it's going to help you. Because what they want to know is part of the admissions process is how interested are you in their school? So when you say to a school, I am reapplying because even though I got into some good law schools, you've always been my top law school. And if you can come back with a new LSAT that's a couple points higher, they want to see that. They want to hear that. Retake the LSAT if you can. Tell them why you're reapplying. And if you tell them why they're reapplying, that's actually a positive, not a negative. If you get off of the wait list from a school, are you still considered for scholarships? Uh, the answer is yes. If they have them. The cool thing about scholarships that you, sh you all should know is if, if your school ends up with an extra million dollars, that million dollars does not carry over to the next year. Point being, a dean of admissions is always incentivized to spend every penny they have. You can't build it up for the kid with a 180 next year. So the answer to the waitlist question is if they have money, they very well might give you money, particularly if you ask politely. Awesome. Well, I think that's actually all that we have time for. I'm so sorry. I know we have a lot of questions left. Um, for the people who had questions that I think I can answer more, mostly about like reaching out to lawyers and stuff, I'll stay on for a few extra minutes. Um, thank you so much, Mike, for being here today. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I apologize for the busy schedule. Um, this is up to Angie, but if, if there's like a critical mass of questions, if there's a lot that we didn't answer, we can always perhaps do it again. But that's up to Angie. It's Angie. Yes, I would love that. We can reach out and try to schedule a round two so that the rest of the people can get their questions answered. We have like 40 left. So, um, <laughs> Sounds good. I'm going to step out. And, thank uh, you thank, so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye. Bye, all. Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask that for an international student, uh, what are the possibilities of getting a good internship in uh, uh, law firms? Um, for an international student in an LLM program or a JD program? No, no, no. I'm asking about internships. Uh, yes, in I understand. Are you an LLM student or a JD student? I'm currently a JD student, undergrad. Okay, and you, you will be applying for an LLM here, is that correct? Yes, I would be applying. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, for LLM students, it's always more challenging than for JD students who are U.S. citizens because a lot of law firms have difficulty hiring folks who are international because there's extra immigration requirements. Um, so that's why I'm asking to clarify the question. Um, I think that, you know, if you talk to any LLM student that's here in the United States, they will tell you that they face very unique challenges in trying to get jobs. Um, you don't get a summer between your LLM program. It's only nine months. And um, so you don't have a summer that you would normally intern with a law firm between your 1L or 2L year or 2L or 3L year. So instead, you have to just apply and see if they will take you as a person fresh out of your LLM program. And that's always way harder. Um, so I, am, I did the traditional JD program. I was not an international student, so I can't really speak to that. But if you want to connect with some folks who I know that did an LLM program who can talk about their experiences, I'm happy to do that. Just reach out to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, barely, but yes. Sorry, um, this is a boon. Um, I actually had a question on, so I'm just in the process of taking my, um, or studying for the LSAT. So I took the first big like diagnostic cold test the other weekend, um, but I found myself running out of time. And so I didn't really answer a good amount of questions. And in hindsight, I'm looking at it now, you know, I probably should have maybe guessed as I would maybe say on the real day. Um, so now I'm just worried that, my that score that I'm now looking at might be a lot lower than my real like my real possible starting score does that make sense yeah that makes total sense 
So One, which has been an LSAT question. So for me, like, it's hard for me to tell you this <laughs> um, because I'm not an LSAT coach. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> that, but that being said, I mean, so do you mean you actually took a real one or just a diagnostic one? Oh, like a diagnostic, like a practice okay. one. Then, yeah, I would totally retake another diagnostic and answer all the questions. <laughs> okay, and then use that as kind of like the, the base score. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Sorry for the sound issues. No, that's okay. Um, anybody else? Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't have my video on. That's what is okay. your recommendation? What is your recommendation for if I am an undergraduate student, like I currently attend Florida State, to apply to law firms and try to get internships? Yeah. Okay. Um. So I would go through, look up all the pipeline programs that law firms have. Um, internships at the undergraduate level are extremely rare. Um, usually there'll be some sort of special fellowship program or something that the law firm does as outreach at the university level. And usually it's only the largest firms that do it. But I will tell you this, very small firms, they ad hoc hire. So like, Sometimes, you know, they'll take you if they have needs. And right now there's a lot of small firms that are underwater with work and they're struggling. And so they're a lot more willing to take interns than they would be normally. I mean, I have a few friends in private practice who are solo practitioners and they're like, yeah, I just went and hired, you know, three temps who are um, pre-law students. And, you know, they're just doing like different fall tasks for me. And so, so. So I, so I think you can be a little bit more creative about it. I think if you're going to be applying to large law firms, what I would be careful about is don't apply for anything that's reserved specifically for law students because you're not going to get it. They're just going to throw out the application. Um, now, if you see something on there that says it's specifically for a college level, absolutely apply. If there's nothing on their website that says whether it's like, you know, whether they have anything at all and you're just doing cold outreach, my advice is talk to the lawyers there and start to ask them more about their firm. All you have to do is get one informational interview with them. And during that informational interview, tell them about your interest in going to law school and you're just trying to learn more about the profession and learn more about their practice and see, you know, have you guys ever taken any college level interns? And if so, you know, what are the best channels for me to go about that? And if not, you know, that's okay, but at least you know. So um, that's my advice for reaching out for internships. Now, I think the best way to go about this is honestly start connecting with lawyers without asking for a job. I cannot stress this enough. If you just talk to a lawyer and you're like, do you have a job? And they're like, no. And then you just ignore them. That lawyer, you just killed that relationship. <laughs> so, um, you know, being in our profession, it's a long game. It's a long term game. And the relationships that you build now, you will carry with you when you become a legal professional. So you shouldn't always be just looking for just like the next thing that you need. Just if you're looking for just a job and they say no, and you just end that relationship, you've lost out on the opportunity to build a long-term connection with that person. I reached out to lawyers before going to law school. I connected with many of them. Some of them I kept relationships with, you know, throughout my law school experience, and they never hired me for a job. But then when I was practicing as a young lawyer, they gave me business or they gave me contacts that got me business. And it, you know, turned into way more because I never had any expectations for the relationship to begin with. And I think that's the way that you should go about building relationships with lawyers. Lawyers can smell it from a mile away when a student comes to them and they're like, do you have an internship? And you're like, no. And then they don't want to talk to you anymore. It burns lawyers so bad when you do that. So go into it, ask for an informational interview. And you can clarify that with, hey, I'm not looking for a job. I'm just, I'm a pre-law student. I'd love to learn more about what you do. And would you be willing to sit down with me for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and just tell me more about your career path? Lawyers love that sort of outreach because it shows that you're interested in getting to know them as a person. Like at the end of the day, they're human beings just like you. And they want to see that you're willing to invest time in them before they're going to be willing to invest time in you. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, yes, it does. I apologize. I'm at an auto mechanic, mechanic shop right now. So my uh, feedback <laughs> is quite loud in the background. No worries. No worries. <laughs> but does that help at all? How do you reach out to them? Like, how do you get their information to reach out? So almost all lawyers have 
websites <laughs> with our email addresses. And especially if they're at large firms, they have to list their email address and phone numbers. So you can always do cold reach and outreach on email. But LinkedIn is super powerful. If any of you are on LinkedIn, um, and you will see how much I believe in LinkedIn and connect on LinkedIn with a gazillion, you know, people. Um, because I think it's a really, really powerful tool. I didn't have LinkedIn when I applied to law school um, because people weren't using LinkedIn in that way to do outreach. But now tons of pre-law students are on LinkedIn. Tons of them are using LinkedIn to reach out to lawyers. Lawyers are used to it. We understand it. I think it's a very comfortable medium for us to interact with people. Um, but yeah, I mean, before law school, I literally flipped open a phone book and cold called a bunch of lawyers. And my chances of hitting, you know, a lawyer that was willing to talk to me were very, very low. Like I talked to over or called over 50 lawyers and I only got to talk to three. So <laughs> I mean, I think LinkedIn is a much better route to go than just randomly cold calling people. That's just my thought. Anybody else? So speaking about reaching out to lawyers, so say you do reach out to a lawyer, several lawyers, and you ask them questions regarding about their practice or what it's like being a lawyer. How do you like continue with that relationship? Like, how do you continue? Thank you for asking this question. I love answering this question. Okay. All right. So the hardest part is exactly what you're talking about, keeping the relationship going. And I find so many students that are comfortable getting that first meeting and then you never hear from them again. <laughs> and so I love that you asked this question. Um, basically, while you're talking to the lawyer in your first interaction with them, you should be taking notes about the things that they're taught and telling you. If you're asking them for advice on, oh, what law schools did you apply to? What did you, how did you pick law schools? How should I go about picking law schools? What are some extracurricular activities that I can do? What are some things that I can do to learn more about your practice area? Or are there events that you would recommend that I go to to learn more about this practice area? take down the notes of what they say and then go follow their advice. And then when you follow their advice, write them a nice email back and say, you know, I really appreciated the time that you spent with me a couple weeks ago. You know, I took your advice and I joined this organization or I read this publication or I learned more about your practice area and it's fascinating to me. You know, I would love to talk about it more. Could you, could we set up another follow-up call? Things like that, you know, you should be using the things that you're finding out in your first meeting to get you that second meeting. And don't, like I said, don't go into it with laser focus with an objective in mind. Your only objective should be trying to get that human being to care about you. Literally, that's your only objective is getting that lawyer to care about you. And the way that you do that is you show an interest in them. I mean, I know that sounds really bizarre, but that's exactly how these relationships work. If you show them you appreciated their advice, you took their advice, you valued it, then of course they're going to want to continue helping you. But if you treat them like, oh, you know, I'm just trying to get something from you and the second that I get that piece of advice, I'm going to run off and never talk to you again, that's the wrong way to go about it. So, um, so use your conversations try to ask them things in the conversations that will help you follow up later. So ask them for advice on what are some follow-up things that you can do to learn more about this practice area, or could they help connect you to other lawyers who practice in that area who could offer different perspectives? Things like that will help you keep the relationship going. And all you have to do is focus on getting one more meeting. That's it. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, so just last question. I sorry for, you know, asking so many questions. No, 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 no. This is exactly what it's for. Y'all feel free to ask questions. Don't apologize. <laughs> uh, so I'm a undergrad law student currently. So mm -hmm. I've done corporate internships uh, as well as internships for NGOs. So it's something like I do it every year, a single internship for in an NGO. So I wanted to ask them, are these internships value the internships I do in NGOs because it's totally for social work, uh, nothing related to the subject. So when I apply to some law school or uh, for a job, are these internships valued or not? Of course, all work experience is valued. It's not just, you know, whether like you don't even have to be in a legal internship for it to be valuable. I mean, 
I had two years of advertising agency experience when I applied to law school. And I wrote about that being a little bit different. Um, what law schools care about is how are you using your time wisely? Are you learning things in these internships? What have you learned in those internships that might help you be a better lawyer? You know, one of the things that I did for the advertising agency is I was the client service person. I was the liaison between the agency and the client. So working with clients was what I was doing every day, servicing business clients, talking to people at lots of different levels, getting to know what it's like to work at an organizational level with all these people. Those were all things that helped me in my legal career. So use, you know, the, the work experience that you have to talk about the skills that you've built that will translate into practice. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. What else? Uh, Angie, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Sure. And, uh, Okay, because you know, you know how I'm so sorry about this, but remember you, we messaged each other about the leg up legal? Yeah. A couple weeks ago? And because I was still deciding uh, what I want to do with law. Yeah, don't worry about and, it. Yeah, and okay, but I've honed in what I want to do. Okay. I, I want to be a prosecutor. Nice. So, uh, yeah, so because the lawyer up, it, helped, it, it really helped like see about like everything I want to do because everyone wants to go like big law and stuff like that. My <laughs> parents wanted me to do that, but like I never wanted to do that. So, um, sorry. So you're interested and, in being a prosecutor. Yes, and... I'm sorry. Yes, yes. And and I want to do the free trial of uh, Leg Up Legal. Oh. I, I, I didn't do it yet because I. No, no, no it's okay. okay. Did you have a question about the way the program works or something? Yes, okay. Uh, it's a 30 day free trial, right? And then, yeah. um, you'll, c it'll connect me with, um, lawyer, l any kind of lawyer, right? G are there prosecutors? So, on, uh, okay. Uh -huh. Our mentoring program, it's all done through a mobile app. You sign up for the mobile app. You build a profile on the mobile app. You can search through the profiles of the existing mentors. If there's no mentors in the practice areas that you're interested in, you can let me know and I'll go out and recruit more mentors, um, in those areas. But yeah, that's how it works. So you, you're going to have to sign up for the program, look through the profiles, see who is out there. If there's attorneys that, you know, you want to talk to, you can go ahead and match with them. If there's no attorneys that you want to talk to, just let me know and I can go out and find more people in those areas. And also um, one last question. So I, I thought about retaking the LSAT because I want to okay. get a higher scholarship. Because Right now I have an okay score, but... Okay. Would you, what's uh, the recommended um, amount of months needed for me to do well? What, what do you think? I know you're not an LSAT. Um, well, you've already but... taken it once. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to brush up on it. I would say at least um, probably at least three months um, to prepare properly if you're kind of starting pretty cold. Okay. Thank so, you, Angie. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Who else? Chris, did you have a, another question? Yeah, for just in your personal experience from like hiring and meeting and things like that and seeing people mm -hmm. in the legal world, how important do you see as the like the T14, the T20, how important is it to get into <laughs> one of those places versus outside yep. of that? Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. So I've been at both boutiques and big law. So a boutique law firm, you know, usually they'll hire um, based off of, you know, whatever their needs are that year. They don't take a steady stream of summer interns all the time. Big law, however, um, does take a steady stream of um, students all the time. For everybody who doesn't know what big law is, it's basically the top 100 and 200 firms in America by revenue. So this, we collectively refer to them as big law. And they usually do have summer internship classes where they take tons of interns. That's getting fewer and farther between, as Mike said, because they stopped hiring groups of like 40 and now they take like 10. Um, but at Big Law, I'd have to say it's extremely important to see, you know, people at T14 schools or you've got to be in the top 5% or 10% of a regional school. And if you're at a lower tier at school, it's virtually impossible. Um, I hate to say that, just, but that's how it is. Um, at Big Law, you know, they still make hiring decisions based on very superficial factors like your class rank and your law school. And the reason that's superficial is because you're, the way that you perform in law school is very, very not indicative of how you will perform as a young lawyer. Because um, 
oftentimes the academic exercise of law school is very far divorced from what the practice of law is actually like. I've seen brilliant lawyers who made C's in law school. I've seen terrible lawyers that made A's in law school. So, um, so I think, you know, at big law, if that's what your goal is, it's very important to go to either a, you know, high ranked T14 school or be like top of your class at a regional school. You know, there's going to be schools that are very, very strong in the particular geographic region that you're going in. For example, here in Dallas, Southern Methodist University is a very strong regional school. And while UT Austin, University of Texas at Austin is like the ranking king in Texas, it's also, you know, super hard to get into and Southern Methodist University would be considered probably the next tier down, but it, they have extremely good ties here in Dallas. So if you want to work at big law here in Dallas, that's a perfectly good school for you to go to and you'll probably get better scholarships and you probably have a better chance of getting in than UT. And if you can be at the top of your class at SMU, I'd say you've got just as good of a shot as somebody coming from UT. Um, so I think it depends on, are you wanting to be in a particular region? And are you, you know, wanting to be what type of practice you want to have? Like, if you want to be at a prosecutor's office or a DA's office, psh, being at a T14 doesn't matter at all. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think that they're going to be much more concerned with your skills, whether you did mock trial or whether you did anything litigation related when you were in law school, um, th rather than what is your class rank at a XYZ school. Um, if you're going to be in boutique firms, however, you know, I think they're going to be much more concerned about your skills, too. Um, while it might be impressive to get somebody from a T14 school, they are going to want to know that whoever they hire is going to be more likely to stay and they're not going to run to someplace like Big Law for the money um, and that that person's going to do good work. So it's different depending on what organization Chris, you want. Did you want to be a Big Law, by the way? I wasn't sure. Uh, yes, I did. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well then hopefully that advice helped. <laughs> um, Definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, oh, and to that point, if you want to be at Big Law, I would start connecting with Big Law lawyers for informational interviews. As I said with the other person, I think that, you know, it r will behoove you to get the perspective of a lot more Big Law lawyers um, who can say, you know, how did they make it there? Cause I lateral to Big Law. So I started off at a boutique, and then I went to a large law firm after I was already, a, I think I was a fourth year when I lateraled. And lateraling is when you're, you know, you don't start off at that firm as a first year and go all the way up. That's called being homegrown. Um, so it's a different ball game for laterals. Um, for being homegrown, that class rank and being at a T14 school really matters. Um, Deborah, will character and fitness hinder your chances at law school? I don't know what character and fitness um, issues you have, so it's hard for me to say. <laughs> um, but if you want to message me privately about it, we can chat about it. Um, yeah, anything else, anybody? I mean, I'm happy to talk to anybody about, like, the practice side of law or what's it like to be a lawyer or how do I talk to lawyers or how do I network with lawyers? Like all those things I'm happy to talk about because that's, that's my wheelhouse. Um, all the things that Mike knows, that's going to be much more his game. But, um, and I'm sure that he's totally open to connecting with you guys. So feel free, reach out to him with your other questions if you have nuanced ones, but I'm definitely going to try to bring him on for a round two because I had like a ton that he didn't get to. So, um, but if anybody else has questions about, you know, what's practice like or how do I talk to people, jump on. Yeah, if I, if I could just interject with one quick question. So this yeah. is kind of uh, uh, this is kind of a question I've been having, but uh, I I'm looking to apply in the 2021 cycle, and I, uh, I I've always pulled really good grades, and I've always done fairly successful. However, I do have attention deficit disorder, and as such, get extended time on. Uh, tests and other programs. And I was kind of curious if you would have any maybe clients or if you've kind of known of anybody's experience who uh, would kind of have, say, a similar experience going through law school with, uh, with say, disability accommodations or what that might be like at all. Oh, um, I don't know of anybody who went through law school with 
um, ADHD or ADD. Um, I don't, I do know people who went to law school with disabilities. Like, um, I had a friend that was blind. I had another friend that was deaf. Um, so, um, and law school was extremely challenging for them for, you know, very different reasons, but I, I'd imagine their experience isn't probably going to be very much comparative to you. Um, I think it still depends on which law school you're at, how willing to accommodate you they are. My law school was very willing to accommodate everyone, but it's also a smaller law school. I went to University of New Hampshire, and um, it, you know, I think that their class size was like 90 or maybe 100 um, a year, so it's a pretty small class. Everybody gets to know each other. You can probably request almost anything from the registrar, and if it seems remotely reasonable, they will give it to you. Um, they let me like move up all of my finals early one year because I needed to go to a conference, and like I don't think most large law schools would allow you to do those things. So, um, so I think it depends. Um, I would reach out to a student maybe at one of the law schools that you're at um, or interested in and ask them about, you know, do they have somebody that they could connect you to who might be going through a similar experience and see what the accommodations are like. Um, and if, or you could reach out to the admissions office, actually. You could probably reach out to the admissions office and ask them, hey, do you have any students that are, you know, also ADHD that have accommodations that I could ask them some questions about what their experience is like? Um, they might be willing to connect you with some folks. And you have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, thank, thank you for doing this. Uh, my yeah. interest is in civil rights. Um, awesome. Yeah. Hot topic civil rights. right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just wondered if you had uh, suggestions on how to like connect in this space or um, if any you know, firms or people or ways to, to go about other than what, what you've already talked about. In? I'm in Missouri, but I plan to um, practice in California. Oh, California Change Lawyers, great organization. They host a gazillion uh, webinars and all sorts of stuff. You can find them on LinkedIn. You can find them on um, their own website. But California Change Lawyers is an amazing um, organization that I'm sure you could connect with a bunch of people who are interested in civil rights issues. Um, and if not, they can, can also connect you to all the other um, California nonprofits that are focused on those issues. Um, I mean, California is very active in that area, so I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, they'd have more than plenty organizations you could connect to. But the thing that I didn't know before law school is that bar associations will often allow prospective law students to attend things as long as you connect with the bar association and ask. So, Students always feel like things are closed off to them, and they're really not. Like, I, even if it, there's a cost or something like that, if you just call them and say, hey, I'm a student, and I don't have the money, and I'd really like to go to this event, they'll just let you go for free. <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, so I'm a part of Dallas Association of Young Lawyers, and we have tons of virtual events right now. You know, we moved everything online and we're hosting all of our webinars online. And I've been inviting a bunch of my pre-law students who want to work here in Dallas because I'm like, it's a good opportunity for you to get to know people right now because people are more open to it. If you've ever been wondering like, am I in the right place at the right time? I know this sounds crazy, but you guys are in the right place at the right time because for the first time ever, lawyers are like online all the time and they're more willing to connect with people online right now than ever. Like usually they're hiding out in their offices doing all their work and now they're like stuck at home online all the time. So um, this is a good time to do that. So go to search bar association events there's bar associations for, God, everything you can imagine. And they're literally collections of lawyers. So you can find um, minority bar associations, you know, Hispanic bar association. Um, J.L. Turner is the African-American bar association here in Dallas. Um, there's the National Asian Pacific Bar Association. Um, there's tons of different bar associations for all sorts of things. There's interest-related bar associations, so like litigation, trial lawyers, um, probably civil rights lawyers. So there's tons of organizations you can go to. And what I would do is I would reach out to the leadership. So reach out to the executive director or the chair or somebody like that and be like, 
I'm a pre-law student. I'm thinking about going to law school. I'm trying to start connecting with lawyers in this area. Can you recommend some events that I can go to for your organization? Or can you recommend some lawyers that I might want to contact? Um, if you talk to the leadership, those are all the people who are active. So they know everybody. If you just contact like a random person who's a member, they might not even go to anything. <laughs> like, so I would, always, I would always reach out to the chairs of committees. Almost every bar association is going to have subcommittees. So check their committees page because you can often drill down to like the exact interests you have. So for example, I did trademark law. So there's the International Trademark Association. There's like hundreds of committees and subcommittees for them. So if you're interested in doing um, just trademark prosecution, there's a committee for that. If you want to do just do trademark litigation, I think we even have like a famous brands one. Like there's all sorts of different subcommittees. So I would always look at as specific as possible and then contact the chair for whoever that committee is. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Well, it was great talking to all of you, especially all the new folks that are on. I'm so happy that you're joining us. And um, I will definitely try to bring Mike back for round two if we can fit it into his schedule. So thank you so much. And y'all have a wonderful, safe, and happy week. We're doing another meetup on Thursday. So come check us out for that one. Um, we have one big law attorney and one who's in-house who they're like best friends from college and they're willing to talk together about um, all the things that it takes to be hired by either in-house or big law. So if you want to learn more about that, feel free to join us on Thursday.